and to welcome you all to this webinar presentation as Greater Ohio previews our 2023-2024 public policy agenda as the work of the 135th Ohio General Assembly gets underway. Before we begin some housekeeping items, today's webinar, as you heard, is being recorded and will be posted on our website in the next 24 hours. For the benefit of those who are having to leave the presentation early or who may be unable to make it this morning. Because the session is being recorded, we are asking that you please remain muted throughout the presentation and pose any questions that you might have today with, uh, in the chat. I am being assisted today with the webinar by my colleague Aaron Clapper, who will be monitoring the chat and forwarding questions to me uh, for our end of presentation Q&A. So with that all out of the way, let's go ahead and get started. So as I said, my name is Jason Warner, and I am the Director of Strategic Engagement with Greater Ohio Policy Center. Through advocacy, research, outreach, and education, Greater Ohio Policy Center strives to create a policy and political climate that allows communities to stabilize and thrive for statewide economic growth. We believe that it is imperative that state policymakers be well informed about the issues and opportunities facing Ohio. Our 2023-24 public policy agenda, Reflect and Refocus, Furthering Resilient Communities, calls for state policy changes that will fulfill our vision of strengthening communities' resiliency through revitalization and sustainable development. This platform channels advocacy successes achieved in the past two General Assemblies, including the creation of the Brownfield Remediation Fund, and continued investment in state transit services. We are also introducing new policy recommendations that are grounded in data and our expertise in legacy cities. The new policy agenda can be broken down into four distinct categories, all of which meet our goals of a revitalized Ohio. This includes revitalizing Ohio's brownfields, connecting people to places, unleashing opportunity in Ohio, and reducing barriers to development and home ownership. So to begin, our first priority is revitalizing Ohio's brownfields. In 2021, the state of Ohio invested $350 million in one-time spending in the new Brownfield Remediation Fund. This oversubscribed program will see more than 300 brownfield sites in 83 counties cleaned up or assessed for contamination. The success of this important program is only just beginning to be fully realized. 125 of the projects which received funding are for assessments to determine the extent of the contamination which may exist on the site and what actions will be needed to be taken to mitigate, clean up, and revitalize the sites. Once this work is done, additional funds will be needed to undertake the work. That is why to further resilient communities, Greater Ohio is proposing to further invest in the Brownfield Remediation Fund with at least an additional $350 million made available to the program. Sites which were being cleaned up with grants from the BRF will be redeveloped into mixed use spaces, remediated for new manufacturing, transformed into affordable housing, and repurposed for recreational use. Ensuring that additional funding is available to address the sites which are being, currently being assessed, as well as making further funds available to sites which missed out on the first grant opportunity is essential for Ohio to remain competitive in the attraction of new jobs, housing, and economic development. Our second area of focus continues to be connecting people to places. In the past four years, Ohio has made notable progress by investing in public transportation, diversifying our transportation network, and emphasizing public safety in roadway construction and design. This work has greatly enhanced opportunities for multimodal transportation system access in both large cities and smaller legacy cities throughout Ohio. Last fall, Greater Ohio released a white paper Building on Momentum, an Argument for State Investment in Public Transit in Ohio, which we'll share in the chat, which provides an assessment of both the current status of the state's public transportation infrastructure and capacity. The report focuses on why, given shortages of reliable workers and a growing number of rural elderly and disabled residents who need transportation options, it is crucial for Ohio to continue to maintain and grow the historic investments which have been made in public transportation since 2019. 
The bipartisan infrastructure law enacted by Congress last year presents an even greater opportunity for Ohio to invest in a transportation network that is designed to accommodate all users, is financially sustainable, and above all else, addresses local needs. Therefore, to further resilient communities, Ohio must maintain or increase existing state funding levels for public transportation. These funds will build on the significant progress made over the past four years and help expand services to tackle employer and community needs, create modern fuel efficient transit fleets and innovate to meet mobility demands of today. It would be short sighted for Ohio to reduce state funding for transit in response to short term increases in funding from the bipartisan infrastructure law. Any reductions could threaten funds that have already been allocated to the state. Likewise, the adoption of the Walk Bike Ohio plan by the Ohio Department of Transportation, Ohio's first ever statewide active transportation policy, must be followed up with crucial investments in active transportation policies and projects. The state, in partnership with local governments, must take a comprehensive approach to creating roadways and mobility infrastructure that gives Ohioans of all ages more transportation choices. This includes walking, cycling, or taking transit. Such infrastructure should be sensitive to context, boost safety and convenience, and offer a comprehensive array of transportation options. Now, Greater Ohio has established a name for ourselves as advocates for Ohio's legacy cities. Ohio's legacy cities are the epitome of resiliency and continue to generate the majority of the state's economic contributions. Although these places have lost population and industry, they are actively retooling to remain the drivers of the state's economy. Ohio's legacy cities offer desirable amenities and incredible opportunities for Ohioans, their families, and their businesses. Just last year, Greater Ohio's own research demonstrated that Ohio is truly a tale of two states, Ohio and Columbus. While the capital region continues to grow, the rest of the state is either falling behind or stuck in neutral. This is why it is necessary that state policymakers think about the needs and challenges of the Columbus area and other places in Ohio as needing unique policies, opportunities, and investments. To further resilience communities, we must first protect the fiscal health of Ohio's cities. Cities large and small depend on a range of income sources to provide the services and tools needed to grow the state's economy and offer opportunity to residents. To effectively and fully contribute to the state's growth, Ohio cities need long-term income predictability and assured access to stable sources of income. Likewise, it is important for us to invest in existing places, work to rest rectify historic inequities, and build capacity. Ohio has hundreds of cities and villages with historic architecture, solid homes, and walkable neighborhoods. Many of these places are older and need to repair or modernize their utilities and life-sustaining infrastructure. Both ARPA and Bill have offered opportunities to invest in residents and neighborhoods and have been marginalized or underinvested in both rural and urban communities. State leaders should deploy funding, technical assistance, and capacity building support to Ohio's left behind communities to keep the state vibrant for existing residents and potential new residents. The Appalachian Grant Program created last year is an example of this kind of effort which must be undertaken statewide in order to ensure that communities across Ohio have the same opportunities to invest in the future while preserving the past. At Greater Ohio, we steward a number of communities of practice which help to advise the work that we do through communities of Ohio, through smart growth strategies to achieve a revitalized Ohio. One of those communities of practice is the Ohio CDFI network. If you are unfamiliar with CDFIs or community development financial institutions, they are financial institutions that provide credit and financial services to underserved markets and populations. GOPC works very closely with these groups through the state and recognizes the outstanding work that they do providing financial resources to underserved communities. That is why we are proposing to create the Ohio Community Transformation Fund. This fund would provide grants to CDFIs for lending and technical assistance to businesses and real estate projects that cannot access traditional bank loans. Many central business districts and commercial corridors are often 
are underutilized in Ohio because developers and entrepreneurs are unable to secure risk tolerant, low cost capital that is comfortable with weak real estate markets. This fund would provide grants to trusted, experienced financial intermediaries who know how to coach borrowers and leverage other dollars to make real estate and businesses succeed. This brings us to our final plank in the policy platform, reducing barriers to development and home ownership. Ohio's communities do not have a sufficient inventory of structurally sound homes and often modern amenities, which puts pressure on the existing housing market. While many housing markets outside of central Ohio have modestly priced homes that could offer accessible and sustainable home ownership, in some neighborhoods, homes are valued so low that responsible home improvement financing is hard to access. At the same time, there is an increasing number of single family homes being purchased by large multi-state real estate investment firms. Growing Ohio's housing stock through redevelopment, infill development, and strategic new development in places that can sustainably handle the long-term infrastructure costs associated with residential development will require an all or above approach. To further resilient communities, we are proposing a two-pronged approach. First, many communities in Ohio are operating under zoning codes that have not evolved with changing market practices. That is why we are proposing the creation of a pilot program to help communities modernize their zoning codes. A pilot program run through the Department of Development or the Ohio Housing Finance Agency would help select communities produce modern zoning codes that reduce the time and paperwork needed to build buildings the markets want, such as two to four unit homes and single family neighborhoods, mixed use buildings and neighborhood commercial districts, and form-based coding that can help unify the feel of a neighborhood or district. However, zoning alone will not help to address the housing crisis that we are experiencing. That is why we also believe that it is important to establish a loan loss reserve fund for small dollar mortgages and home improvement loans. We are proposing the creation of a new loan loss reserve fund, which would also be housed at either Department of Development or Ohio Housing Finance Agency that intermediaries and local housing agencies can apply to, to underwrite small dollar mortgages and home improvement loans that exceed loan to value ratios that traditional financial institutions must adhere to. While these are the direct issues which Greater Ohio is proposing, that we are also well aware of the fact that in any given two year legislative session, any number of other issues will arise. To that end, Greater Ohio Policy Center will continue to advocate for policies and initiatives with the Ohio General Assembly and the DeWine administration related to capital investment, budget and taxation, housing, brownfields, transportation, and other areas. We will champion solutions that are fulfill our mission to improve Ohio's communities through smart growth strategies and research and fulfill the vision of a revitalized Ohio. Now we've covered an awful lot of ground today and I admit a very short period of time, but we do want to uh, have the opportunity to now respond to any questions which you may have. Uh, I see that we already have some questions submitted through the chat and I would again encourage you if you've not already done so to go ahead and pose any questions you may have about the issues that we have discussed today in the chat box below. Hmm. So the first question I have is, can you provide a definition of legacy cities? So uh, legacy cities, uh, Greater Ohio defines are communities that uh, have experienced decline over the past uh, anywhere from 20 to 50 years. Uh, great examples of legacy cities that we work with here in Ohio are communities like Springfield and Clark County, um, uh, Illyria and Lorraine uh, in Lorraine County, uh, Marion, uh, places which are actively working to um, sort of reverse some of the downward trends that they have experienced over the course of the last 50 years, whether that be in the job market, uh, housing, and just overall population growth. These places have an awful lot of uh, amenities that they can uh, uh, utilize, uh, which help to enhance the quality of life for folks that are looking um, to, to start families and businesses. And, uh, and we uh, work with these communities to help to 
uh, grow those opportunities that exist for them. And I see Aaron has has also answered that already in the chat. Thank you. Uh, talk about the zoning support. How does a local municipality get involved selected for that project? So Aaron, I appreciate that question. So we have actually already started to put together um, a uh, recommendation uh, draft language that we are going to be soliciting to the General Assembly, uh, which would be utilized uh, as part of our advocacy work. Uh, the program itself is modeled after several programs um, in both in Ohio as well as other states. Uh, essentially, what we are recommending um, is a little bit of what you see with the Appalachian Grant Program, where communities would have the opportunity to apply to the state agency for the technical assistance grant. Um, we're still trying to settle on what the specific uh, amount of money that would be available through such a grant program would be. But essentially what the community then would be able to do is to hire a planning professional who would be able to assist the community in uh, working on the rezoning work. Um, a lot of states that have a mandate uh, that they have updated zoning codes, an example of that being the state of Massachusetts, um, make such grants available to communities uh, on an annual basis. We are looking to put some restrictions around the communities that would be able to uh, apply for that program. And uh, certainly would encourage anyone who's involved in that work, if they have recommendations for that, to reach out to us uh, so that we might be able to better structure that uh, program. Um, so again, if you do have any questions about what we've discussed today, I would encourage you to submit your questions uh, in the chat box. Um, yeah. We're all being very shy this morning, I see. <laughs> okay, next question. Uh, how can local organizations, communities get involved in supporting these efforts? Sarah, thank you very much for that question. I uh, would very much encourage you to, uh, to get into contact uh, with me. I'll be having my uh, contact information available here at the end of the webinar. Uh, if there are specific programs that you are interested in advocating uh, on behalf of, um, obviously, we are sort of in a wait and see mode at this point. The legislature is just getting organized, and uh, the governor was just sworn into his second term uh, on Monday of this week. Uh, the budget will be introduced at the end of the month, as will uh, the first pieces of legislation that we're anticipating uh, for the new General Assembly. Nothing has been introduced to date, um, but we do know that those bills will be forthcoming. Uh, the budget will be, as always, the primary um, avenue that Greater Ohio is going to be pursuing a lot of the efforts that we're going to be undertaking this year. That includes, obviously, the Brownfield funding, uh, as well as the public transit funding, but also some of these other programs that we've highlighted today, such as the zoning program. Because we would be looking for funding from the state, it makes sense for us to pursue that as part of the budget. Uh, our hope is that uh, we'll have legislators who take an interest in that and we'll uh, work with Greater Ohio uh, to have that included in the budget. We do know that some other groups that we've already spoken to, uh, other uh, statewide organizations have expressed interest in supporting, for instance, that zoning proposal. Um, we've had very good feedback from a number of groups and uh, I think I'm okay to go ahead and call out that the uh, Ohio Municipal League actually included uh, a similar proposal in their policy agenda, which they released last fall. Uh, so we are excited about that and look forward to being able to work with the Municipal League uh, on championing that particular issue. And if this is something that you also are interested in, I would encourage you to get in contact with us that we might be able to uh, coordinate any advocacy work that we can do on that or any of the other programs um, that we are involved in. Uh, scrolling through here, give me one second while I read this next question. Um, uh, so this seems more of a comment than a question. It's regarding um, the uh, supporting small business growth. Um, that uh, that there's a but there doesn't seem to be a lot of follow through. Um, 
Yes, uh, we agree. Uh, there does, I think, for there for a very long time, unfortunately, the tendency with a lot of the economic development support that has been coming out of the state has been a little bit too focused on Ohio's urban areas and not enough on some of the smaller communities, specifically the legacy cities that I have mentioned. Um, we recognize that the Appalachian Grant Program is probably the first real program that we have seen that has been solely focused on a particular area of the state that does not really constitute a major urbanized area. Um, we see that as a very positive step forward. And we know that uh, Governor DeWine, for instance, has spoken at length uh, through his first four years in office about working to help out what he refers to as the left behind communities. And our hope uh, in advocating for some of these other programs that we've mentioned today during the webinar is that that is going to be something that will be replicated statewide. We recognize that Appalachia in particular has been a area of the state that has long been neglected when it comes to investments and economic opportunities, uh, as well as community revitalization. But we also recognize that there are communities be it in Northwest, Northeast, Southwest Ohio that are experiencing some of those same challenges. And our hope is that through investments in programs like the Appalachian Grant Program, we can see other opportunities for the rest of the state modeled after that and see some of that investment made so we can help uh, to grow all of these communities because I think we all recognize that a rising tide certainly lifts all boats. And, uh, and we definitely hope that we'll be able to see more of that in the next uh, few years. Uh, let's see, I have a question here related to transit funding. Uh, do we anticipate uh, transit funding for the General Assembly administration will be the, be the same or will there be cuts? Uh, so that's a very good question. Um, we're sort of in a wait and see period at this point. The only indication that we have right now about what might be coming down the road were the budget requests which the various state agencies submitted to the Office of Budget and Management last fall, where they outlined uh, what their anticipated needs uh, for operating costs for the next uh, two-year budget cycle were going to be. Uh, in reviewing that document from the Department of Transportation, there was a uh, request for addressing the line item for public transit funding. Uh, the current budget currently has about $40 million per year, which is made available to public transit uh, through the general revenue fund, with additional revenues being set aside uh, from what we refer to as the uh, FHWA flex funding. That is the federal gas tax money that Ohio receives, which is not as restrictive in its use as the Ohio gas tax is. And so the state has, for at least the last decade, uh, made funding set-asides available from the federal funding, which can be utilized by Ohio's transit agencies. Uh, it's about 50-50 in terms of what's available in GRF versus the flex funding right now. The budget request, which was submitted to OBM, suggested that uh, the Department of Transportation was going to be looking to uh, reduce the amount of GRF funding, which is being set aside. Um, for in the uh, in the budget for public transportation. Uh, I believe that the document that I saw suggested that they were looking for about $10.5 million uh, per year that would be made available uh, through the GRF line item. Now that in no way is an indication that that will be what is in the governor's as introduced budget. That was a uh, number that was included in the requests to the uh, office budget management but uh, that number can certainly change between when the request is made and when the actual budget document is uh, produced and submitted to the General Assembly. So we're going to be keeping a close eye on that to see what the uh, administrative budget proposal would be. We know that we have seen uh, a strong move uh, in the direction of furthering support for public transit funding. Uh, just last month, there was a letter which was submitted uh, to the administration by the uh, Ohio Public Transit uh, Association, OPTA, uh, which included a number of uh, co-signers that included uh, significant support from Ohio's business communities. 
Um, this included uh, not only local chambers of commerce, but also the Ohio Chamber of Commerce, as well as the Ohio Business Roundtable, expressing their strong support for further investment in public transportation, as these organizations recognize the fact that it is critical uh, for Ohio to be able to get uh, workers to jobs. In addition to the other things that I've mentioned before as part of our white paper that focused on uh, the human services end of, of what's needed for public transit. So we're optimistic uh, that with this uh, increasing support that we're seeing, uh, as well as the fact that the General Assembly in the last two budget cycles uh, has uh, directed the administration to put more money towards public transportation uh, in 2019 to the tune of $70 million. And as I said, in the most recent budget, about $40 million in, in general revenue funding that was going to transit. So we're cautiously optimistic uh, that we will see more support going to public transportation. Um, hopefully that will come from the administration, but if it does not, we do believe that we continue to have a strong uh, level of support within the General Assembly to be able to push for more of that investment. Hmm. Uh, let me scroll through here. And uh, part of the issue of local resources to manage grants, keep small towns. Um, okay, I guess that's more of a comment than a question. Scrolling up here, Let's see if there are any others. Looks like that was again another question about uh, transit. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so again, yeah, if you have any questions, please go ahead and submit those uh, through the chat. Um, getting a lot of questions about the, on the public transit front, which I appreciate. Um, yes, thank you. I see that Aaron has, uh, has shared uh, the public policy platform document itself in the chat. Uh, if you want to take a look at that, um, you certainly are free to do so. Uh, we do have a couple more minutes for questions. So again, if you do have any, please go ahead and submit those uh, through the chat box. Uh, and uh, we'll be more than happy to address those. I will uh, go ahead and, uh, and, and add while uh, we're waiting some, for some additional questions. Um, the other one that we are very optimistic about, uh, being able to get uh, strong support from both the administration as well as the General Assembly, will be uh, additional support for the Brownfield Revitalization Fund. Uh, we've been uh, very encouraged by the strong support that we have seen for that program, um, especially uh, the fact that the program was oversubscribed um, in its first year of operation. Uh, $350 million going out the door is no small feat. And uh, being able to get that accomplished um, in uh, around eight, about a year actually from when that program was launched uh, to when the final application uh, closed. Uh, there were three opportunities to apply for those grants. The third one uh, opened on uh, July 1st uh, of last year and closed in about three days because they had exceeded the number of requests for funding um, than they had available dollars for. So that's very encouraging. We're excited about uh, to see these projects get off the ground, and uh, we remain encouraged about the, what we're going to see moving forward uh, in terms of being able to continue to grow that program. We do see the Brownfield Revitalization Fund is really touching on all of the uh, different policy platform positions that we have discussed today. Um, remediating brownfields is crucial for all of these other levels to be able to succeed. We also believe long term that it will be necessary for the state uh, to have a permanent dedicated program. Well, we certainly have been going about it uh, in the last budget. And our, our current ask is to continue to put sort of that one time GRF revenue towards the Brownfields Fund. We think that in order for this to be as successful of a program as it can possibly be, it should be a program that does have a sustainable dedicated source of funding that communities know will always be available so they can be able to plan uh, and uh, uh, make development investments as needed around uh, a predictable program like that. So we're gonna continue to work with the General Assembly um, to make the case for why we believe that it is important that that be a sustainable long-term investment program. But 
recognizing right now that there is strong interest in uh, the revitalization of the brownfields. We'll continue to work with the General Assembly uh, to get those uh, one-time funds so we can really address the issue. It was uh, more than 10 years um, between the end of the core program and the creation of the Brownfield Revitalization Fund where we didn't really have the resources available to clean up the brownfields. So with this funding available right now, we're really being able to tackle some of the bigger problems and projects that are out there. Um, the question we have here is talk about expanding access to workforce training opportunities. Uh, workforce training is not really something that is part of Greater Ohio's uh, policy agenda. We do recognize, however, that it is something that is important for a lot of communities. We know that uh, the Dwight administration and the General Assembly have been prioritizing investment in workforce development uh, and training and uh, anticipate there will be more of those uh, programs uh, coming um, both as part of the, uh, the next budget uh, as well as, uh, as, as other um, proposals that we anticipate coming from the General Assembly in the next two years. So uh, I'll go ahead and do one last call for uh, for any questions that you might have. Otherwise, we'll go ahead and uh, and wrap up uh, our uh, our webinar presentation today. Um, so once again, I want to go ahead and uh, thank all of you. Uh, who have uh, been able to take the time and join us today. As we close, I want to uh, again thank you uh, for joining us as we have discussed our public policy agenda for the next two years. I greatly appreciate you taking the time to learn a bit more about our priorities for 135th Ohio General Assembly. I want to invite you to stay connected with us as this legislative session does get underway. You can see on your screen my personal contact information as well as where you can find our full policy platform on our website, a link that has already been submitted in the chat. Uh, you can also follow along with Greater Ohio and myself on social media, including Twitter, which I think is still operating as of today. Uh, both the Greater Ohio Policy Center and my personal account informations are there, and uh, you'll have the, uh, we'll be providing regular uh, updates about legislation, including the budget once it is introduced at the end of the month. Uh, and begins making its long and at times complicated journey through the legislature. And speaking of the budget, this is an opportunity for me uh, to offer a totally shameless plug about our next webinar, which will be taking place on Friday, January 27th at 11, a link of which will be submitted in the chat, uh, and where once again we will be offering our Budget 101 webinar. We will be previewing the budget process from introduction to enactment, uh, barring leaks, uh, I will not be offering any insight into what will be in Governor DeWine's main operating or uh, public transportation uh, budget proposals, but instead we'll be providing a step-by-step -step guide to the entire state budget process, gleaned from my 20 years of working both inside and outside of the state legislature. Space is limited, so in order to participate, you must register uh, in advance. I hope you'll be able to join us uh, on February 27th. I also want to mention uh, before we go that registration is now also open for the 2023 Ohio Brownfields Conference. Greater Ohio will be hosting the first conference in nearly a decade on Tuesday, May 9th at the Westin in Columbus, where attendees can learn about brownfield funding opportunities, remediation, and the VAT process, network uh, with remediation and redevelopment professionals at our exhibitor hall, and much, much more. Finally, a reminder that today's webinar has been recorded and will be posted on our website in the next 24 hours for the benefit of those who may have had to leave early uh, or who are unable to make it this morning. So once again, I want to thank everyone who has joined us this morning. I appreciate uh, you taking the time out of your schedule, and I hope that you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.